Hey guys, Mike here. I made a few videos now on how to use uh, uh, an Unraid server, how to build your Unraid server, how to use a QNAP server. Um, I haven't made a video yet on, on FreeNAS, but I probably should. Uh, so basically I've done a lot of stuff on, on NAS servers, network accessible storage. So <clears throat> what I want to do this evening is talk to you about how to choose the proper platform for what you're trying to do with your NAS. So whether you would like an appliance, you could just open the box, slap some hard drives in it, throw it on your network and start working. Or whether you like to tinker and you want to build a server, uh, how do you go about that? How do you choose the software, whether it's Unraid or FreeNAS? Or why would you choose an appliance over building your own? And there's some good reasons for doing that. And there's a lot of times I would recommend you go out and uh, uh, pick an appliance such as a QNAP device to build up your server. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about some of those. And uh, instead of sitting here talking to you tonight, I'm going to go to a slideshow and do a voiceover on it. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of good bullet points there to explain this to you. And I'll come back at the end of that video and uh, we'll conclude at that point. What I want to do is talk about how you're going to pick your particular NAS platform. So some of the things we need to look at, uh, or some of the options we have, I should say. Uh, you can either pick a plug-and-play appliance, and that's any one of several commercial uh, NAS units that are available at retail. So, such as your, my personal favorite, QNAP. Uh, there's also Synology. There's also Drobo. Uh, Western Digital and Seagate are in the game. I've got my opinions on those devices, but that's beyond the scope of what we're doing right now. Um, some are better than others. Um, again, my personal favorite is QNAP. I've had experience with other people with Synology, good devices. And essentially what you do there is you go, you pick out the features you want, you find a unit that is going to satisfy those requirements, and then you purchase it and you buy a set of hard drives to put into it and typically you're going to um, well let's put it this way some of the devices you can buy have a single hard drive and that's basically I, I just got a home server I want to get to some files while I'm on the road so I'm going to slap a drive into it and connect it downside to that is there is absolutely no online backup so you're kind of on your own for a, a backup solution there's no mirroring or anything they also make two drive options, which is a bit better. You can mirror two different drives. But what most people end up doing is going with a four to six bay, maybe an eight bay unit for expandability, where you throw in those drives and you're typically gonna start with at least three drives so that you can take advantage of something called RAID 5. And what RAID 5 is, is it builds a certain level of redundancy into your drives. Whereas um, if any single drive fails, you can replace that drive and the data gets rebuilt based on the redundant data of the other drives, okay? So that's essentially a short version of what RAID 5 is. There's other variants of it, uh, such as ZFS, uh, such as parity drives, which are implemented on both Unraid and in a different manner on storage spaces for Windows. So we'll talk about those as well. So just a few pictures here. Um, I see a Synology. Uh, NAS up there, uh, QNAP NAS, both of which are basically appliances. You buy them, you put your drive in them, and you're up and running. They've each got their own proprietary OS, and they're both very good OSs. They're a pleasure to use. They both got their own cloud access ability. Um, so you can't really go wrong with that. And there's pros and cons to both of them, and we'll talk about that. And on the left, you just got a typical uh, self-built NAS, if you will. Uh, so you just get a motherboard, a case, an appropriate case, and put, put the items together. We'll talk about uh, hardware choices and why you might choose particular hardware over others, depending on, again, your use case, what you're trying to accomplish. So continuing where we left off. Okay. <clears throat> so here's some possible use cases. Uh, for example, the first one I'm going to pick is a small business server. This could be a home server as well shared by anywhere from two to a hundred people and it contains critical business data so this could be if you're a small business your customer records your ordering information 
your tax information, um, your product plans, your roadmaps, any number of things uh, that are either critical to your business or that you have a responsibility to protect, such as your customer's personal data. Now, you don't. You want to make sure it's secure so it doesn't get out, and you want to make sure it doesn't get lost because you might need that, especially things like tax records or sales order information uh, or customer orders. Now, if this is in a home environment, this could easily be your family photos, uh, your family videos, just things that you don't want to lose or that would cause either financial hardship or emotional distress if it did get lost. So these kind of servers you're going to build are going to have to rely on redundancy as well as a good backup strategy. Okay, uh, a second item that we should look at or a second use case here would be video editing professionals. So this could be anybody from somebody making YouTube videos or it could be uh, a video professional doing weddings and other types of events like that where they need to take a large amount of digital information or raw video footage and store it someplace and potentially interact with it as they're editing it. So there's still an advantage of doing this on a NAS over your local PC because the NAS is going to offer a certain level of redundancy, uh, such as with RAID 5. So if you lose any one drive, you can rebuild that data without losing it. Uh, again, not a substitute for a backup, but it, in most cases it will get you back up and running faster during a failure than otherwise possible. And the third use case I want to present here would be a home media server, which in this case, this is actually the more simple one where you just have a file server that essentially holds your movies that get streamed to your television, usually through an app similar to like Plex, for example. In this case, you generally in a normal size household, you only have one or two people streaming movies. The data is read in a linear fashion. Um, and if you lose the data, it's typically not the end of the world because your chances are you ripped it off the original DVD anyway. So you can always go back and repull that. These servers can be used for other things as well, such as your, your financial records and stuff. And there is a certain level of redundancy built into these types of servers as well, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so, now that you've got these use cases, what kind of questions do you ask before you go out and start building your server? Uh, the first one, do you want a turnkey solution or do you like to tinker? This is the easiest one and it's going to guide you in the right direction right off the bat. Uh, if I just want to take something out of a box, plug it in, and start working, I'm immediately going to go to one of the big uh, NAS vendors. Again, I recommend QNAP just because I've used them and I've had good luck with them. Um, and I've got videos on that in the past as well. If you want to build stuff, and I do enjoy doing that, and there's some good reasons to do that as well that I've covered in previous videos, uh, then we got to talk about what kind of hardware you want to build. And these other questions kind of go to that point. Uh, how critical is your data? Is it replaceable? Uh, you know, if it's customer information or sales order information or even your tax records or your family photos, that's pretty critical. And in most cases, that's not replaceable. So you want to make sure you build a server with an adequate amount of redundancy in there and also one that can support a valid backup plan, whether that's sending it up to a cloud via crash plan or if you're putting it onto your OneDrive or your Dropbox or if you're just copying it and taking it to another building somewhere. Um, but you're definitely going to be taking a different approach to your server if you have absolutely critical data that you cannot lose versus um, you know DVDs you can easily replace. Uh, how much data availability do you need? This is basically goes to your uptime. So if I lose a drive and I have to rebuild it, um, but I can still get to my data, that's not really downtime. It's just a little bit slower, right? Uh, if my server goes out let's say at a hardware level, and I need to wait to get it replaced, I'm down for a month, uh, that there is basically hardware downtime and that you, your data will be unavailable during that period of time. And again, I got another video with that where with some of these appliances I had, if they went down, I had to send it off to get repaired and I had to wait to get it back. That's one of the reasons I leaned toward building my own for my home media server. 
um, in spite of some of the advantages the appliances offer. And there's ways to get around that as well if you need that kind of uh, availability. Uh, what kind of data will you be storing? Uh, documents, databases, raw videos, uh, movies, confidential customer data. Uh, again, it, it comes back to, is it replaceable? Is it backed up? How quick do you need access to it? Okay, so back to my previous example. If I rip a DVD and I put it on my server and I lose that drive and I lose that data, I can go back and re-rip the DVD after I rebuild it. That's not a big deal. If I lose the photos of my children when they were five years old, I can never get that back. So that's a much different situation where I absolutely have to have redundancy both on the NAS server as well as an offsite backup. So those are the types of things you need to consider. If you have a lot of data you don't, you don't want to, re to lose, let's say you're a video editing professional, uh, you need to build in a lot of redundancy and a lot of hardware to make sure that data doesn't even get corrupted going onto the server. Okay. And then lastly, what's your budget? <clears throat> How much do you want to spend? Um, you can build a cheap server and you will get a cheap server. Uh, if you want to build the ultimate in reliability and redundancy and performance, um, you're going to spend a little bit for it. It's, what's the old adage? Uh, good, fast, or cheap. Uh, pick any two. and It's very true. So let's move on. So let's talk about appliances first. There's a lot of turnkey NAS solutions available out there. And you basically go to the store, you pick them up, add some disks to them, and you are up and running, really. you got a little bit of configuration to do, but you can be running within an hour or two. They're typically very well built, and they're supported by very large companies that specialize in just this thing, so they know what they're doing. Okay, uh, I can tell you by performance, working with a QNAP, on a, a RAID 5 it is a very fast performing device even on a fairly low end processor they put in the box so they have very optimized operating systems in them uh, they often have creative features for example um, they have devices that have multiple NIC cards in them for greater performance for multiple users they have Thunderbolt connections which are ideal for video editing professionals because you're gonna have basically the same bandwidth as you would have and maybe even greater bandwidth than you would have with a local drive. So you can do that video editing on the NAS server while still taking advantage of those, um, those redundancy features like RAID. These devices have proprietary hardware and proprietary operating systems. Let me start with the operating system. Having a proprietary operating system is not necessarily a bad thing, okay? Their operating systems are actually quite nice. Uh, they're easy to use. They're easy to configure. They've built a cloud server that you have access to that allows you to gain access to your files in a secure manner without opening up inbound holes in your firewall. And you get all that just by buying their product, right? It also has proprietary hardware, which is designed to work very fast even if the processor is not a screamer, right? So it's designed to work very fast uh, and be reliable. However, and this is where the vendors for these particular products would probably not like me, but however, when you need to repair them, you do need to send them off to the company. You can't just go down to your local uh, computer hardware store and pick up a part for these things. I mean, unless you have like a RAM failure, you could do that, but uh, in my case, I had two failures in a year, um, which required replacement of a motherboard. I was out of the unit for a month, and because these are proprietary units, I couldn't do anything to get the data off the drives until those units came back. So if you're going to go this route, I would say either get a service plan, which I believe the vendors offer. you got to pay extra for it. So if there's a failure, they'll send you an advanced replacement unit before you send it back. Um, or... And this is where it gets costly. Remember I talked about budget? Or buy a second unit to have as a hot spare. So if something goes bad, you can throw your drives into a second uh, box and get up and running. And it kind of depends what you're trying to do with it. If it's your family photos, maybe you can wait a month or so for the vendor to send it back to you. If you're a video editing professional where this is going to take your business down, you better have a hot spare on hand. 
because otherwise you're not going to be working, right? It's like most photographers have two cameras. So if you want to go with the appliance, there's a lot of advantages to it, but you have to be prepared for the fact that you can't fix it yourself. So to use cases that would apply very well to an appliance, uh, easy setup, critical business data with support, you got somebody you can call for help with these devices. You don't get that if you build it yourself, mostly. Uh, they usually have applications. There's an app store on these, and a lot of them they have a built-in app uh, backup support. So uh, whether it's crash plan or copying your files to, to OneDrive or using rsync to copy to another server, it's all in there. A neat feature of some of these devices, such as, I keep going back to them, such as the QNAV devices, is they have a built-in HDMI port. So if you did want to use it as a media center, you can just plug it right into the TV. There's a remote control that you can get for them. Some of them even come with it. You can go out and uh, just control your movies right from the device itself without needing uh, third-party software. Okay. Now, these are appliances. You take them out of the box, you put drives in them, but you do have to have a little bit of caution. What types of drives are you going to pick? So in most cases, desktop hard drives are not appropriate for a NAS. Um, and the main reason is desktop hard drives do not have something called TLER in it, uh, which is basically an error correction strategy. So the desktop hard drives, if they sense an error, they fail fairly quickly, actually even if there might not necessarily be anything wrong, but what happens is that the NAS controller, the RAID controller on, on your server, picks up on that, pulls the device out of the array, and starts doing a rebuild. So if you have a four drive RAID 5 array, and one of those drives go out, you've lost your redundancy. So if this happens on one other drive while that drive's being rebuilt, you've just lost your entire array. It happens. So you really do need to get a NAS drive for these that know how to deal with um, not just error correction on themselves, but to be able to work as a team with error correction, which is essentially what TLER is designed to do. It defers to the NAS controller for the ultimate um, deciding whether or not to rebuild the drive. Um, the other thing is NAS drives are typically running 24 by 7. They run in hotter environments. So you want something with a longer mean time between failure, which is what they provide. So at present, the two NAS drives I know of are Western Digital Reds and then there's Reds Professional. Main difference is the drive speed there. Um, and then Seagate also makes NAS drives now, which I have absolutely no experience with them. So I'm not going to recommend or steer you away from them. Once you have your hardware picked out, you're going to have to do OS choices, right? So if you're doing an appliance, you're going to use the proprietary um, operating system that comes with your uh, QNAP, your Synology, your Drobo, your Western Digital. They're all going to have an operating system built in. You don't have a choice. It comes with the hardware. If you're building your own hardware, you've got a choice between Unraid, which, as you know, I've used with, uh, with my servers, there's also FreeNAS, which we're going to talk about briefly because that's, um, that's appropriate for some of these use cases I'm presenting to you this evening. Uh, there's also Linux, um, which is basically, you're just going to put it out there as a file server and you'll build that up itself. And you can also pick Windows Server, um, and that's appropriate for certain situations. For example, maybe you also want to coexist a database server on it. Once you choose your operating system, you also need to choose your file system. And in some cases, uh, your operating system choice will dictate where you're going with this. So most proprietary solutions are going to uh, your appliances are going to be able to choose between RAID 1, which is mirroring between two drives, RAID 5, which is um, multiple drives with a single redundancy disk. So if you had five disks, uh, you get four disks worth of storage. Uh, the data is striped across them, and if any drive fails, you can replace that drive without losing data. RAID 10 sort of combines both of them, 
whereas you have a RAID 5 set of a, a, a array, and then you have a second array, which is basically mirroring the first one. So it gives you uh, both striping and redundancy. Now, one thing I do want to mention about RAID is because the data is stored across multiple disks, when you do a read, it's reading off multiple drives heads at the same time, so you have the potential to have increased performance. Will a single user reading a file notice it? Probably not, but if you have multiple people reading data from that same uh, same server, uh, yeah, the performance gets a lot better. Also, if you're doing very large files like video editing, that striping, that striping is an advantage to you for uh, performance. Uh, ZFS, this is a file system that's used heavily in FreeNAS. Uh, it's considered a very advanced file system. And if you're using FreeNAS, I would highly recommend you use ZFS. It does have certain hardware requirements to go with it, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Unraid, there's a multitude of file systems there. XFS, BTRFS, there's a RFS itself. But it really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, each disk runs independently. There's no striping here. So each, each, each drive runs individually. Uh, there's a parity drive and a cache to speed up writes. And I've got another video on that, so I'm not going to get into too much detail on that. Lastly, you can use Windows Storage Spaces, which is, I guess, similar to um, Unrated. Well, not really. It's got multiple disks. It distributes data across them, and it creates a parity drive. Um, it works really well. I like how you can just add in drives or remove drives from the array. What I don't like about it is the write performance is really, really bad on it, uh, at least in my experience. Uh, so that's something to consider. Another option, of course, if you're going to use a Windows Server, you can just go out and get a dedicated RAID card to go with it and get better performance as well. So I want to build my own server. Why would I want to do that and what advantages am I going to get and how do I continue. Um, one of the advantages you get control of the hardware. You pick what you want to put in it and you can build it to the task you have at hand. Sometimes this can save you money. Often it's not necessarily cheaper than an appliance. And you can customize it for the actual purpose of what you're trying to do. An example, a home media server. In this case, we're just serving movies for a home theater. The original media exists on a DVD that can be re-ripped, so we're not going to lose the data, right? It's always going to exist somewhere. <coughs> Likely, you're only going to be pulling one or two streams at a time, so probably on the main TV in the house, and maybe somebody else is going to be watching it on their iPad. This is probably the cheapest type of NAS server you can build. So in this case, you could potentially repurpose some desktop hardware. You could take that old desktop computer, throw Unraid on it, and you're up and running. Uh, try not to use gaming PC hardware. And the reason is, typically gaming PC hardware is not as reliable. Kind of like if you were to look at a, a Formula One race car versus like a Chevy, I don't know, Chevy Caprice. Boy, I'm dating myself with that one. But... The one car is meant to last a long time to drive around, whereas a Formula One car is meant to last exactly the distance at a race before the engine blows up. Certain OS choices use single drives at a time, so it's not RAID per se and does not require NAS level drives. So an example here, Unraid. You add in drives as you need them, but it typically stores information on a single drive. So if you have five drives, it might store this movie on this drive or on another drive. It sort of um, completely obfuscates the file system from you, so you don't necessarily know what drive it goes on, but it definitely goes on one drive. So that whole error correction you need with RAID, uh, you don't necessarily need it in an unRAID environment. And by the way, like in my unRAID server, I purposely tell it if I'm putting a movie on there, keep that entire movie on a single drive because otherwise what happens while I'm watching it, if it has to start spinning up to the second drive, or sorry, if it has to start um, reading from a second drive, I gotta wait for that drive to spin up and it causes a pause in my movie. So I try to keep entire movies on a single drive so once that drive spins up, I can watch it and it just streams out to the end. Uh, 
If you are using like RAID or ZFS though, uh, then you do need NAS level hard drives. The other nice thing with Unraid with these media servers is if a single drive fails, similar to RAID 5, I've got a parity disk that can rebuild that information. But unlike RAID 5, if a second drive fails, I can still regain the data on the drives that did not fail because it's not striped. So I might have movies, uh, I might have Star Trek on one set of drives, uh, Star Wars on another set of drives, uh, Lord of the Rings on another set. So if my Lord of the Rings drive died, I'd still have Star Wars and Star Trek, even if the parody drive was also out. Uh, you just mount the disks so you can recover the data. That's actually a really nice advantage to the Unraid system that I like. Uh, but because they're not striped, you don't get the performance advantage you might get with a RAID 5 system. So it depends. Are you looking for additional data reliability here and maybe the ability to use cheaper hardware? Or are you looking for performance? So one of those trade-off questions you need to ask yourself. So let's move on. Video editing professional. Uh, talked about earlier. Goal is store and edit large amounts of digital data. You want RAID here or ZFS or something to provide additional protection against data loss. This is one of those cases where I actually will recommend an appliance such as a QNAP device with Thunderbolt in it because that Thunderbolt connection is going to provide insane bandwidth to your editing workstation. Uh, if you don't want to use Thunderbolt and you want to build your own anyway, or you want to build your own anyway, um, I would recommend multiple NIC cards, especially if you have multiple users trying to use it. In any event, I would absolutely recommend a wired Ethernet into that server because you're not going to be able to do video editing with enough bandwidth over wireless. Okay. Next use case, uh, Soho Business Server. This is what we're talking about with um, keeping customer data, uh, sales data, things that are irreplaceable basically a business server, or again, this could be in your home, just dealing with your family photos and whatnot. Data loss would be costly, either financially or emotionally. Uh, let's assume multiple users are accessing it simultaneously, so performance is important, so that single drive solution, or sorry, where, like for example, Unraid, if you're pulling files off a single drive, striping is helpful, um, because you get have multiple drive heads working at once. Whereas uh, a single drive would just be, uh, it would impair your performance. And I should probably give you a video on performance numbers. But uh, moving on. Let's, to build this out, things to consider. You definitely want a server-based motherboard. Um, or a server-class motherboard, I should say, and a processor. Uh, Supermicro makes some excellent uh, server-class motherboards. In addition, you probably want to try to get a Xeon processor. They're really not that expensive, and it's designed for exactly what you're trying to do. If you're not going to use an appliance for this purpose, I would recommend FreeNAS. It's designed to be a commercial-grade server, and it actually doesn't cost you anything other than you do need to spend money on the hardware. Consider ACPI support. If you're using a super micro motherboard, they do have some that that have ACPI, and what this is is it allows you to do um, headless uh, maintenance of the the system. You don't need to plug a keyboard or a monitor into it. You can just access it over the web, and that includes before the OS boots up. So you can actually look at the BIOS configuration, all the stuff you can before the OS goes in using ACPI. Now, if you had bought an appliance like a Synology or a QNAP, that's got headless support just out of the box. Anything you build probably won't have it. Actually, my Unraid server, I don't have a keyboard and monitor plugged into right now. Uh, but every time the power goes out, it doesn't reboot itself. I need to go in and change a BIOS setting to get it to automatically boot up. But I got to go out there and put in a uh, keyboard and mouse on it. And I just haven't got around to doing that yet. If I had ACPI support, wouldn't be a big deal. I could just go in there and fix that right now. Um, NAS drives are a must in this case because of what I mentioned earlier as far as the error correction goes and trying to keep your NAS happy so it doesn't try to rebuild your drive. In this case, please do not use desktop drives in your server. 
if you look at all these components, you're going to realize this is this costs more money than like my home media server example. There's a reason for it. You're getting a certain level of redundancy and reliability. And the other thing I want to mention, ECC memory is a must. Uh, that's basically error correcting memory. And especially if you're going to use FreeNAS because it does cache so much in memory, you want to make sure that you maintain data integrity and it doesn't get corrupted going to the drive itself. Uh, yeah, I was going to try to come up with an analogy, but I can't think of an appropriate one. Anyway, if you want to access this through clouds, I'm a, I don't trust any of these servers really to have direct uh, access into your system, especially if you have critical data on it. So I would highly recommend you put a VPN solution in. So essentially you got to authenticate, get on your home network to access it. Or if you look at one of my earlier videos, you can do a hybrid solution where you take uh, an appliance. Um, again, I used QNAP and use their cloud access solutions. And then you can, uh, basically map external drives to that QNAP and you could access your information within your network through that functionality. And uh, they also support uh, two-factor authentication, which helps a lot as well. So why do we make certain hardware choices? Uh, I like the red drives because the TLER support and it just plays nicely in a RAID environment. Whereas desktop drives like to take care of themselves and are really rogue and independent. Um, your red drives, they like to work as a team. Okay, ECC memory required for digital integrity. Uh, if you're using FreeNAS, you kind of have to have it. If you're using Unraid, depending on what you're trying to do, you don't have to have it, but I would still probably recommend it for mission critical if you can afford it. If you built your server based on an AMD platform, there is no uh, ECC, at least on certain processors. So it depends on what you're, what you're trying to accomplish, right? Um, now here's the thing, a NAS drive, you can still use it in a desktop computer, it'll work just fine, but it shouldn't be used in a mission, but a desktop drive shouldn't be used in a mission critical server. So, ECC, uh, if you're using ZFS, it's recommended. By the way, one thing with free NAS, they recommend for every, uh, for every gigabyte of, what is it? Yeah, every terabyte of space you have, you should have a gigabyte of RAM. So if you have uh, 16 terabytes of drive space, you should have 16 gigabytes of RAM. That's the general rule with FreeNAS. It is very RAM intensive. But ZFS provides you a lot of advantages as well. This video would not be complete if I didn't mention backups. Regardless of what you choose, backups are essential no matter what you do with redundancy, you can't get away from this. Besides having potentially catastrophic multiple hardware failure, you can't escape the fact that you could still have uh, catastrophic physical damage to the facility that the NAS is stored in. Your office could burn down. Your house could burn down. You could have a flood. Okay, So you need to have a backup, and preferably not a backup that's stored right next to the drive that, or the device that could potentially be wiped out. Offsite backups are good. So if you have a place to take your offsite backup, great. If not, consider cloud services. Um, OneDrive, Crash Plan, Dropbox, anything. Uh, if you have cr customer data on there, please use strong encryption before you store it on these cloud environments. So if somebody did compromise your cloud account, they still couldn't do anything with the data. Uh, you're responsible for your customer's data. And you're also responsible to make sure your identity doesn't get stolen, right? If you have a second NAS or you can afford to get a second NAS, I recommend that as a, a, also a backup solution, which will also increase your system availability. Uh, there's applications available on these appliances to do it, or, and actually even on Unraid and FreeNAS, there's applications available to do this. Or you could just use R-Sync in a schedule of replication between the devices. So guys, that's basically it. It's a quick crash course on how to choose how to build your, your server. Um, whether you're going to choose an appliance, you're going to build one. Whether you're going to choose Unraid or FreeNAS. 
just some high level bullet points. Clearly there's going to be uh, situations where uh, you're going to diverge from what I just recommended based on more customized use cases and, and what you're trying to do with it. But hopefully these guidelines gave you a good place to start and some things to look at as far as uh, choosing your hardware or choosing which path to go. If you got any questions, please let me know in the comments. Happy to help. If you liked what I did, please click the like button below. Take care.